Welcome to Mastering CS Candid Leader Insights, the podcast where we deep dive into the world of customer success with industry leaders. I'm your host, Irina Cismaj, and today's guest is Amy Newbury, Head of Customer Success at Clean. Amy, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Irina. Let's jump right in. You were promoted to Head of Customer Success at Clean to streamline and scale the department. What was the first thing you did when you stepped into this role? I guess there were a couple of things. So I moved into the role last June, at the start of June, and I had a conversation with my C-suite, sort of understood the, the sort of risk levels that they were looking for and the kind of key objectives that they wanted me to hit. And for me, having worked in the team previously already before moving up to head of, I felt that there was quite a lot of lack that we could trim when it came to client interaction, which might sound controversial in customer success. But being a starter, I felt like there was a lot of nervousness around not speaking to customers. And so I did a bit of analysis into my team's activity and my own activity and found that a lot of legacy customers were maybe getting a much sort of higher touch experience just because we were so scared about losing them rather than them necessarily requiring that level of kind of touch or whether, you know, they were very valuable or even high risk. So my first thing I said it to my team was get rid of every meeting in your diary that is a weekly, that is a monthly meeting and our standard is now quarterly and essentially sort of halved, quartered the workload of my team within a day. And the reason for this is then I thought, well, what's the worst that could happen? You say to a customer that you've been having monthly meetings or bi-weekly meetings for years, you know what? I feel like we should have fewer, more valuable calls. Most of them were like, oh, that's a great idea. And so again, it was that idea that we need to change the format of the way we talk to customers, but actually also change the cadence and maybe doing a bit more with less would mean that our team has a bit more headspace and the ability to scale without us just adding more and more people into the team, which I think can also be somewhere that CS teams kind of fall down a little bit, but we can get onto that. You mentioned removing the meetings, so we're trying to do more with less customer interactions. I want to deep dive into this area. So tell me, what does a rock solid plan for scaling the CS department look like in your experience? I think if anybody had like the finite answer on that one, Arena, then <laughs> then the world of CS would be solved. But I'd say that like from me, I think it is about really creating a value and value driving conversations when it comes to speaking with customers. And a lot of the work that I've done with my team is helping them to feel empowered and feel almost like a consultant. So I think a lot of what we were doing previously ended up being, we joked about it, vibes-based conversations. Mm-hmm. It was transactional conversations. We spoke a lot about maybe people's personal lives or listened to feedback and didn't really know what to do with them. But I think that actually switching those conversations into being in my line has been always ask that extra question. If a customer is talking about something that they're working on, feel free to interrogate it and don't feel like you need to have all the answers. You can just say to them, actually, could you explain a bit more about that? Or what does that mean for the business by you doing that? And that means that then you start to get into the deeper value driving conversations that then help you spot opportunities, spot risks, and then kind of allow the customer to come away saying, actually, that was a really useful call. I'm glad I was on that as opposed to I have to have this call just in general. How did you structure your team? to make sure that they are efficient and they are working smarter, not harder. A lot of what it's been for me over the past kind of year and a bit has been around training up my team, empowering them, promoting them, making sure that they feel A, valued in their role, but B, have a very clear path for them to then progress I know with a lot of startups, you know, everyone's a VP, right? Everyone's got this lofty title. But I think there's actually no greater feeling than saying, you're here now. You need to be here. If we build this framework together, agree on it, and then we check it in 
one month, three months, whatever it is you think that person needs to do and assess that criteria that you've set out, then it means that then you as a leader end up having more people who operate in the way that you need them to do. So I know that some customer success teams end up having people who come in and negotiate for them. And that's not how we're set up anyway. We're not a big enough team to warrant that. But I think that actually being able to negotiate, hold your ground, know where our line is, is a really empowering thing for a customer success manager to then move up into being a senior customer success manager or even ahead. So I think that the idea is that you help your team rise around you so that you can do more and get with less, which it seems to be the theme so far today. Do you, do you think it's much more easier when you are promoted from internally? And when I say easier, I mean you are more successful in the role of health if you were initially part of the team and you know how it works. So you've been there. So you know what are the pains of the CSM when you get promoted as head of CS and when you run actually the team. Would you consider this as your advantage, the fact that you've been part of the team? You know, as you were asking that, I was actually thinking, not to sound like a politician, but there's there's yes and there's no to this. One of the things is that I think one of the problems with getting promoted internally is actually getting people's mindset to switch that you are mm -hmm. a person, that you're a person who can offer this thing as opposed to the thing you were offering before in your role. And I think that's the same with any promotion that people can go through. There's always going to be that person in the company that remembers you on day one and you made a huge mistake or <laughs> you didn't say the right thing in a meeting or whatever. And I think that it's almost like that youngest sibling thing, like everyone remembers you when you were four years old as opposed to now when you're a grown adult with a four-year-old, you know? And I think that can be something that you need to overcome on a personal level. You know, you need to think, I need to be this executive presence and I need to go into these meetings with a C-suite that I was never privy to before and hold myself accountable for my department in a way I didn't have to engage with that before. But on the flip side of that, if I was to just start fresh in this job, clean is an incredibly complicated tool. And the fact that I didn't need to learn what that does and I didn't need to learn the customer base meant that I actually was able to potentially go, right, these are all the things I've been wishing that I could change before and couldn't and didn't have to think about that. So I think there's good and bad to both of those, like to that situation, essentially. How do you manage the balance between being hands-on with clients? Because I know that you still are, regardless of the role of the head, but also leading the team at the same time. How do you balance the two parts? Yeah, I think it's a thing that at first when I took over the role, I was potentially struggling with a little bit more. So like, you know, for full disclosure, I didn't lose any of my customers when I took on additional responsibilities. And actually my customer base has grown in the time that I've been head of. And I remember having a conversation with my CEO when he was like, you're just going to have to learn to change hats. So at one point you put on your CSM hat and you our CSM and that's all that you do. You listen to customers, you have those value driving conversations, you have your eyes on renewal. And then sometimes you've just got to put on the other hat and deal with a difficult situation with your team, be it dealing with a difficult situation for one of your team members, customers, thinking strategically, projecting, doing all of those things that you need to do as a manager. But equally, I think you should never let your experience in one affect the other one too much. I think you do need to retain a certain sense of separation. Like if I acted with all of my customers, like they were more important than my team's customers, then that would make my team incredibly demotivated. And similarly, if I let all of the kind of baggage of my day as a CSM, you know, you heard some bad news from a customer or you're going through a tricky time with a renewal or something like that, you let that affect then your direction and your plan as a manager, that would then impact your team. And it might also impact the conversation that you then move into as a manager. You know, I don't want to create a biased opinion when I go into a management meeting, for example, I need to keep that roundness and I think basically separating two is the only way you can do it. 
How do you make sure that your team is focused on what really matters? I think it is about working out those priorities with the company as a whole. So to give a kind of example, when I took over the team, we'd had a really tough year in 2023, as I think a lot of SaaS businesses had and a lot of businesses had, which meant people had been made redundant in our customers' teams. People were more nervous about buying long-term contracts, that kind of thing. So it'd been a really tough year for retention. And so basically my set task that I'd set, but also agreed with my C-suite was retention. We are going to improve retention by X percent. And I think that keeping people focused, therefore, is about removing all that extra stuff. I think particularly in small companies, sometimes you can end up spending ages on like a project, be it like a health scoring system, or is it that we're going to revamp how we work cross communicatively with another department. And actually, you don't always know what the long-term goal for that is, or it doesn't necessarily go anywhere because it's not the key thing that's going to actually move the dial for the business, for the department. So I think basically it's about starting each week with a one-to-one or a kind of huddle with your team and going, what's everyone going to do to fix this problem this week? What is your focus What are the two, three key objectives that you think will help this? And I think it helps them recalibrate everybody's, oh, I've got so many things to do, back down to some simple ones, which is like, we're going to retain customers. What are the conversations this week that you're having that are going to help you get there? I feel like in some cases, because I do know a lot of stuff end up on the plate of customer success, the role of the manager is to be like a guardian that says, no, this does not affect our KPIs where this action can wait because it doesn't impact the retention in your case. Do you feel like your role in some cases is to say, no, this is not a priority because you are like a buffer between the C-suite and your team and your role is to protect them and make sure that, okay, they work on what's important. How does this level of negotiation between C-suite and your team work out? Yeah, I think you need to pick your battles. So I think that in some cases it's about, you need to still be open to experimentation. So I think if you were to shut down every idea that comes up as that is not relevant to the single goal that you set out. I also don't think that's a particularly startup mindset and growth mindset. Like you do need to almost create like a certain capacity in your team or in a month, let's say, like, let's pull this out and not make it like in a day. Mm-hmm. They can go, you know what? We're willing to give that a go. Equally though, I think you need to have a very strong line as to where those requests are going to derail what actually the key focuses are. So, you know, you sometimes find if you get another head of department who's new, who joins, and, you know, they're coming and they've got amazing new ideas and they're firing them up. So, yes, can you provide us with loads of case studies? Can you provide us with all of these stats on our customer base? Can you provide me with X, Y, Z, that kind of thing? And it's like, wow, this would be so many great things to have. But actually, it's my team to then spend the time to maybe compile some information I don't know if it's going to be better than potentially, you know, this person living in a a certain role or whatever, and actually just letting my team kind of propagate through and then you learning how to do that. So I think sometimes it's a balance of going, this is worth us giving a shot. And actually, you know what, as long as everybody's aware of the risk that we've got these three really important renewals happening this week, do you want us to take some time out in order to do this thing? Yes, no. And then the other side is then going, hmm, is this request a long-term request or is it just almost like a short-term sugar hit that someone's asking for? That's actually probably going to kind of annoy your team because whilst they're doing it, they'll be going, do they actually need this? Is this just a a plaster Mm -hmm. over a bigger problem, for example? Because now you are interacting due to the role of head of CS, you are interacting more with the senior management team. How do you make sure that they see the real value of the customer success? And how do you prove internally the value of the CS? I think that is a very good question. 
in that, I think as somebody who works in a tech SaaS startup, you want that product to essentially mean that you don't need to exist, (laughs) right? As a company, that needs to be the mindset that something so good that people stay with it and pay more for it year on year, whether you're there or not. The true fact of that is that one, that's not how a lot of other businesses work. And I think there needs to be a level of respect across the business about what that means and therefore the expectation from your customers that CS needs to be there as their wingman, as their confidant, as the conduit, et cetera. So I think that some of it goes without saying. However, in terms of proving value, like honestly, money speaks loudly. So if your team (laughs) is consistently delivering in terms of renewals, upsells, whatever it is, you know, partnerships, referrals, whatever it is that is actually driving real monetary value back into the business, like nobody can argue with the value of that team. You know, if you're delivering X, like Mm -hmm. how the X over what your salary headcount is. Speaking about revenue targets, how do you approach setting them for your team? Is it a top-down directive or a bottom-up approach? I'm curious how those internal negotiations go. Yeah, we're actually kind of going through a bit of an interesting transition, which I'm excited for. So historically, we always retain like NRR targets, which has been mostly around retention because we haven't had a clear upsell strategy. We haven't necessarily had a product suite that is geared towards like significant upsells, we've now shifted the product focus, which is really exciting. And it's taken a few iterations, of course, but we're in a really good go-to-market place. And so having got ourselves to Q3, hitting our NRR targets that we set out in advance or thereabouts, according to my projections, so we've got another quarter and a half to go. Now we're looking into next year and next year is going to be really fun, I hope, because it'll be all around the upsell value driving kind of strategy. So I think the level that we're going to hit is going to be quite cross-functional. Me and our VP of revenue who looks after our sales team in particular have been starting some interesting conversations around how the two teams can actually work together in a more cross-functional way than we have done before. But it is about being open to other people's ideas that, again, keeping that core belief inside yourself about the reality of what your team can do, the reality of what your customer base is at. I know we'd all love to say like, hey, we can sell 30% more of everybody's contract value onto every single customer. But you know that this team is like downsized last month or you know that this company has had like really undersold on their budget this year and actually retaining them is a much higher priority than upselling to them. So again, I think it's about just like combining your knowledge with the company's big vision and working out a compromise when it comes to that. Because I think targets are good, but I'd say like unachievable targets are actually demotivating for particularly CSMs who have to manage risk a lot more, I'd say, than like sales team who are taking on new business and each deal is fresh. Mm -hmm. Because you've been on both sides and you've consistently hit your targets as a CSM, what's your secret to achieve that? Even when the market conditions are not in your favor, what's your advice for CSMs who are struggling to deliver on their targets? Yeah, I'd say focus and then mitigating risk. I think one thing that we've done much better in the past year has been to keep a really close eye on those higher risk accounts and work them into renewal in a much more strategic way than before, where previously, you know, we maybe weren't as focused on this one specific thing, which was retention. Now we've got a very clear sort of path to renewal, but also escalation path as well. And we can find different combinations of people who can really help get these deals over the line. I'd say on a personal level, building a really strong relationship with a lot of my clients has been really helpful. Like it's the strength of the product, of course, but it's also making sure that you stay really close 
to your customers, develop that trust, develop that understanding of their business, help them to understand the value of the platform. And then it makes all of your, your conversations a lot easier. I know that's a really like simple thing to say, but it genuinely is like, you've just got to gain that trust, be a part of their team. And then your life is a lot easier, I'd say. Did you also have the situation where customers you had in your portfolio were ghosting you and they were like, I don't need you. I know my way. I don't want to talk to anyone. Did you have this approach as well? And how did you deal with those type of customers? Yeah, you've got to lead yourself at the door, I think, with a lot of CS management. You know what? If someone's telling you everything's fine, I just don't want this call. You've got to listen to them. Even if you're like, yeah, but I've been told I need to meet with somebody once a quarter and I need to get these five pieces of criteria from each of these calls. Otherwise, you're going to churn. Like, I think the other thing is you've got to take people at their word. I've got a stakeholder with a customer. They head up like an engineering team and they are an engineer at heart. They'll meet with me quarterly. But honestly, I've shortened our calls. Normally they're an hour long for those general stakeholder led. You might have people from multiple departments on it. If it's just a one-to-one chat, feel free to make it a 20 minute catch up. And like you've got to listen to that appetite from your customers. Equally, you know what? Some customers aren't keen to meet at all. I think you probably got to put those guys more in the risk bucket and understand that Like there is very little you can do if you can't speak to them. They have no interest in speaking to you. You just need to be responsive to that and then try and engage them across multiple other departments. So like if they're a marketing campaign that you think they might be interested in, are you hosting a webinar that they might want to listen to? So you just then got to take that slightly more, I'd say like distant approach to engaging them rather than expecting that everybody has the time or interest in speaking with you. Did you also get the opposite? And by opposite, I mean, you had a very good relationship with your customer, but in the end, they still decided to part ways. We have had this as a team, to be honest, and it's heartbreaking. It's the best (laughs) way to put it because like you never go down easily. And I feel like part of what you do is always try to mitigate this through, you know, if you look at their contract value or you look at additional things that you can throw into their contract that will help bring them that value or can you deliver that one piece of insight that's going to help make it all click. I think as we scale, we're becoming a bit more confident at forming that criteria by which you can say the risk to this account is this amount. We believe we'd need to put in this amount in order to save it. And even then there's no guarantees that this is going to work. Is this worthwhile? It will also cost probably about X amount of hours in meetings and preparation. So again, is this worth it? And I think that it's really sad because you spent such a long time working out these accounts. But at the end of the day, people's priorities can change and you've just got to start thinking about it more like a business than like a personal relationship. And again, like I tell this to my team all the time, I'm like, it's not personal it's business, but it's hard when you've got a customer facing role because, you know, you know where they went on holiday, you know, <laughs> you know when they got married, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, he, and and they become almost like your colleagues in a way. So yeah, I think there's like no easy situation when a customer decides to move away from the business. It's just about making it more of a strategic conversation rather than a personal one. Let's also talk a bit about the account expansion part, because I know that you've had a big role. How do you go about identifying and pursuing opportunities to grow existing accounts? What's your playbook? Yeah, so as I said at the start, we operate almost entirely on a quarterly cadence with our customer. But within that, a lot has to happen in that quarterly meeting. So I think it's about making that an incredibly valuable conversation with them and maybe setting out some objectives at the beginning. So one of the things, again, that I've sort of coached my team into is thinking, what's the best thing that could come out of this conversation? So essentially draw out a few objectives of like, wow, they could want to proceed with this project. They could want to buy this piece of software. These are things that I want to get out. This is best case. 
what are the worst things that could come out of this conversation? So again, you almost prepare yourself for, are they going to say, you know what, we thought about it, we're not actually sure we're going to proceed. Again, how then going into this conversation, can you turn this into maybe another call or a different type of conversation that actually turns into saving the account or even upselling them to a different model or whatever it is that's not working for them. You mentioned that the expansion part is something that will be accommodated in the future as well. Do you also use technology in order to help you identify those opportunities to drive those meaningful conversation? Because I know that you are a technical person, so I'm curious, how do you use the tools in order to identify those opportunities, absent opportunities or account expansion opportunities, and not only, maybe also mitigate or identify some or predict some churn signs. Yeah, so we don't have any like CS specific tooling in house at the moment. I think it's probably something that we'd look into next year once we've kind of, we've gone through quite a lot of change. We've got changes in sales, got changes in our product offering, that kind of thing. So I think we don't really have enough evidence to support what the next three, six, 12 months would look like for me to then tool up to make any predictive responses. So that was my thinking and kind of keeping this slightly more analog for the time being. What we do do, so I am obsessed with projections. <laughs> I love projecting and I like constantly do it. And I think that one of the exercises that we're going through at the moment is pulling out those opportunities versus our product base, just as a baseline for it. So I think we're kind of going step by step. One is like identify some opportunities and test them. If you test them on a certain set criteria that that we've set out, five different points, then does that work or does it not work? And then From there, you can almost turn that into something a bit more programmatic because until you've worked out what that criteria is, you could spend all this time building analytics, reporting or whatever, and it could actually do not very much in terms of your decision making or could make you make the wrong decisions because you're not assessing it on the right criteria. So I think we're quite early in this, but it's an exciting possibility so that when the time comes and we're like, you know what, we're pretty clear that these lead to clear key indicators, that's when we can bring in more of a technical approach, bring in one of our analysts, for example, to help us, even bring in our tech team to help us bring this forward. We've done a lot around pulling out, you know, app usage stats and bringing out touch points from our CRM system. But again, it doesn't always lead to the same thing. If someone's contacting you because they're having loads of technical problems, doesn't mean it's the same thing as someone's messaging you loads because they're really engaged in a positive way. The data isn't always smart data. And I think we need to test out a few different ways before we really settle on what good would look like and where the opportunities sit. I think you are perfectly right. And a lot of CSMs that I've been talking to are very keen on gathering or monitoring, measuring a lot of data. They have the reports and unfortunately they don't know what the data mean and what's the story. It's a smart advice to be able to, first of all, test it, understand it, pivot. And then when you know for sure, then try to bring the tools in order to take it at the next level. Speaking of advice, because we are almost ending up our conversation, what's one piece of advice on scaling a customer success department that you would like to share with our audience? Don't scale too quickly. (laughs) This is tough to say to your CSMs, right? Because everybody wants to be part of a bigger team or have like fewer problem accounts or whatever. But I think that One of the most valuable, one of the most happy places a team can be in is where everybody's got a set role. They know what it is they're doing and they can do it effectively. And I think that quite a lot of the time you can add a bunch of tools to CS or you can add a bunch of people to CS and you end up with quite an ineffective mix. Like I think if you can train up your team to be really effective at what they're doing, you don't need as many of them from a financial and keeping your C-suite happy perspective. 
but also what they're doing is more valuable. And each of the conversations they're having is better. It's more fun for them. They feel empowered. They're not nervous going into calls. Equally, they can handle renewals on their, on their own. They can handle tough mitigating situations on their own as well. And I think that is one side of it. And I think that also not adding a bunch of extra sheets and reporting or tools or whatever where needed can also be quite valuable. Like you need to have your key North Star metrics and you need to track them at the moment. For me, it's projecting, like I'm obsessed with it. I love my projection calculations and I play with them a lot. But equally, that's not to say next year that'll be the same. And I think, again, it's just about keeping that focus as to what you really need to be able to succeed rather than adding layers of complexity that ultimately just adds time into everyone's week that, quite frankly, you might not always have. Finally, where do you see the role of CS heading in the next few years? And how are you preparing your team for that future? Yeah, I mean, I think anybody who uses tools such as LinkedIn will know that AI is coming in hard to CS. So there's lots of like AI bots being built that can do the customer face role and that kind of thing. But like, I think genuinely that's quite a long way off. And I think there will always be a value in having some really critical key players within a CS team. It's just how business works. I think that you need to be able to master tooling and potentially remove extra items from your job that can be done by technology. But I'd say that you also need to become that consultative voice, become that trusted voice, and your job will always be vital to a business, I'd say. Thank you so much, Amy, for sharing your insights with us today. And a big thank you to everyone who is actually listening. We hope you found this conversation as valuable and inspiring as I did. Until next time, stay safe and keep mastering customer success. Bye-bye, everyone.